this uh, stuck with me. So that's uh, probably the origin of a lot of these uh, members here. And uh, this one pretty much is the same uh, compositional base, basis. And then here, uh, this one is called Descent. And uh, in playing in those uh, houses, I once uh, was almost killed when uh, we, I and my friend Larry put boards across the third floor of a house that was pretty much uh, mantled with the outside uh, siding. But the uh, chimney piece uh, <clears throat> was still open when we were up there in the attic. We laid boards across. The boards didn't uh, rest on the sides of the space of the chimney. And so when I stepped on the board, I went through. But luckily, and there was the, the furnace was down below with all this sheet metal. And so I was hanging on there. And I was looking down and saw if I fell, I would just be cut into pieces. So uh, ever after, I've been fascinated by images of people falling on timbers. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Goya's print of a bullfight where the matador is uh, impaled on the bull. And the background is absolutely quiet. I mean, the audience seems to be uh, panicking and running, but there's this element of silence there, the static bull. And uh, that is the origin of these members here. This was uh, the first print I did after grad school. I got a job teaching in, uh, in uh, Berea, Ohio, and uh, worked uh, for maybe six, eight months on this there. And forms of human anatomy and uh, seashells and that sort of thing from the Oregon coast are in there. This is uh, a little known technique that deserves a lot more uh, uh, acknowledgement. It's called a, a collotype. And it's, a, it's made from a uh, gelatin material that receives a, a light sensitive uh, coating. And then uh, transparencies are placed over that. Light is exposed through the transparency and it hardens parts of the gelatin like tanning leather uh, and the parts that uh, are not hardened uh, absorb moisture water so uh, you roll water on the gelatin during the printing process and then roll your color over that and parts that are uh, unable to absorb water, uh, have the ink adhere solidly. The parts that are more uh, damp uh, uh, accept less ink. The uh, beauty of this is that uh, for a linear inch, uh, it has uh, 900 printing potential 900 printing elements on it, whereas Photogravure per lineal inch only has about 450, so it gives you a remarkable range of, of value. You can stretch the value way out in the detail that's possible. Mostly, uh, you see this in books that are, are, are photographs, uh, have the imagery of you know, photography, and around the turn of the last century, the technique was used for fine art books. It was an expensive process, mostly dominated by uh, German print shops. And when the First World War occurred, uh, the popularity of the technique diminished because of the anti-German feelings in the United States. So this is obviously not a photograph, or based on a photograph, a series of uh, three plates that are uh, printed sequential and it's just a simple leaf thing. But I hope you can come up close and see how the textures are so finely detailed.
Jim, does it actually go through a press or is it a hand process? Yeah, it goes through a press, yeah. I'm sorry. And uh, here, uh, I, uh, Myrna, Myrna and uh, Burks and Vicki Vanderslice uh, weren't mentioned in the uh, accolades that were passed out uh, earlier, but uh, they started a commercial press here, and uh, a lot of artists learned a lot about printmaking uh, from them. Myrna was a graduate of the Tamarin School of Lithography, and a very generous person. And, uh, when she saw this engraving, uh, this, by the way, it took me two years to engrave, and I worked pretty steadily on it. Uh, I was teaching at Portland State. There were two others that preceded this, which we couldn't get in the show. Uh, but this is the most detailed one. And it's uh, really derived a lot from Dürer's print, The Night, Death, and the Devil, which uh, Jenny and I uh, went to Europe in 60. You know, in 84, 85, and I, I would go from museum to museum and see the different uh, examples of the print. Uh, you know, print isn't always exactly the same when it's even when it's editioned, and, and uh, we studied the little variations in Dewar print, Night, Death, and the Devil. In that print, uh, a knight, a medieval Renaissance perhaps knight is uh, stopped in, in a quarry, a stone quarry. And uh, above some woods and the helmet of the knight uh, is the holy city that the knight was trying to get to. And beside, uh, the, sides of, uh, on the sides of the quarry, uh, death and the devil uh, are trying to detain the knight to, to dissuade him from completing his journey to the holy city. But he's looking straight ahead and down below his loyal dog is there. And there's also uh, a lizard under the dog, which always made me marvel at, at, at Dewar's uh, capacity to encompass uh, grand ideas about existence. So we start uh, with a lizard, then there's a dog, then there's a horse, then there's the knight, and trying to uh, dissuade uh, the knight are, are these uh, abstract uh, concepts of the devil. And death isn't such an abstract one, but our, our uh, awareness of death is like uh, a theory or a sensation or a feeling, I guess I should say. And then, of course, at the very top is the holy city. So it's just a beautifully compressed thing, although Dewar, of course, is known for loading detail in, into his work. But nonetheless, there's this grand idea that just sort of compresses all that uh, detail. And so um, here I uh, tried to depict, uh, not too inaccurately, uh, one side of this quarry, which is kind of uh, like a theater set so surrounding the whole scene. And uh, then the distant mountain back there is without the holy city, of course, the, the, the depths that suggest the distance that was in the original print. And, uh, Glad by then you were taking your time looking at the Durers. You said earlier on you had a, earlier on when you saw the Durer show, you said that you kind of ran through it. I know. It looked the same, so I'm glad you started looking yeah. more carefully. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, as I said before, when I started doing engraving, I, I realized that these uh, great Renaissance masters were capable of producing bold, grand ideas, but they, they, building them up. Uh, uh, Schongauer and uh, Dürer and uh, many others. They never lost sight of the, the big picture. So Myrna Burks, who was running uh, the press at the time I finished this, saw the print and challenged that was me. North Light. North Light. North Light edition, thank you. Um, and she saw the print and uh, challenged me to do a lithograph 
Um, and so with very little time to uh, adjust to another technique, uh, I, went, I went out uh, several days a week to her studio. The stone itself is about as big as the frame, and the image, of course, in the lithograph usually is inside the stone, so the bigger bar would come down and be released on, on the space at each end. And um, it was the biggest lithograph I've, I've ever done. It is. And that yeah, took nine months. Commit you to never try again, right? Too big and tedious. <laughs> well, I, I guess I've done other lithographs since then. Well, that nothing size. as big as that. <laughs> and uh, the, making the transition from engraving to uh, lithography was. Uh, well, I don't know what to compare it to, but it was just a mind-boggling uh, kind of experience. And my big fear was that, um, well, at the end of each working session, I would cover it, of course, but she had all kinds of visitors, and I was terrified that she would uh, pull this material off and somebody would sneeze on it. Because a lot of uh, people sneeze a lot in the court. And, and once you get your saliva on the stone, you etched it. Because they, often the acid we use on these stones is about the same uh, pH factor as our saliva. And uh, so I had a, a drawing on there of somebody who was sneezing. I think I put a big X there. <laughs> and, uh, then um, I took a liking to monoprints after a period of despising them. I thought that uh, to uh, stray from the classic uh, print techniques was uh, being an apostate of some kind. And uh, the first ones I did, I didn't like and I never showed anybody. And gradually, I saw that there was a nice uh, transition from printmaking into painting. And not that I've done much painting uh, in oils or <coughs> any other medium uh, since uh, this period that we're talking about. But nonetheless, I've always loved painting. And 